there's lots of things that can possibly make an action scene exciting. But I think two of the things that I've become really obsessed with in studying other people's are uh, what I think of as embodied perception and consecution. Uh, we can define those in a minute. But I think they're both ways of uh, bringing the reader closer to the action, sort of removing some of the mediation that other kinds of prose might create, and also um, just like staying with the character's experience instead of kind of rushing through it. Uh, I think one of the uh, maybe pitfalls of writing action when you're starting out is you feel like things that are supposed to be exciting should happen quickly. And I think the opposite is often true. It's really about the way we sort of stay with the action that makes it compelling as opposed to like how fast paced we can make it. Okay, so let's start with embodied perception. What does that mean? So uh, I think there's like a clinical term called embodied perception that means something slightly different. But I think for our purposes, we're talking about how the action and the details of a scene get filtered through a particular body and a particular person's like psychology and perception. Um, you know, the, the easiest way for me sometimes to define it quickly is to show the opposite. Uh, I teach a lot of classes on like world building and science fiction and fantasy and students who are like really interested in the world, but maybe not interested in characters have this like, uh, like thousand mile stare at the thing where everything's being described, but none of it's coming through like an individual person's consciousness. And so you feel very distant from it and you don't feel like how it feels to really live in the world. So embodied perception is where we're, uh, filtering the scene through like a particular person's consciousness and their particular bodily experience of it. Yeah. Really focusing on the experience, like the sensory experience. Yeah, like absolutely. Sight, sound, smell, all those things, working all those different levers makes it a more satisfying read. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that's embodied perception. And then we have something called consecution. What is consecution? Yeah, again, there's there's different ways to use the term, but for our purposes, I'm thinking of it as uh, consecutive steps of an action presented in sequence with each individual step or most individual steps rendered in high detail. Um, so an example I often use in class is like uh, Jack baked a pie is a description of, of a thing. But then if you go through the steps of Jack baking a pie, you are staying with that action a little closer. You're seeing it in more detail. You're seeing the hands in the dough. You're seeing the way butter smells. You're seeing all these different things that let you have a better idea of what that thing actually is. Um, and usually that gets us closer to the emotions that go with it than just sort of saying, uh, Jack baked a pie, Jack drove a car, Jack buried a body in the desert. You know, like if we can stay with those actions, we get uh, just a lot more texture of them. And it also gets us closer to sort of the emotional texture of it. Okay, so the next issue has to do with pacing, because what you're suggesting is to slow down when it mm -hmm. comes to embodied perception and consecution. But I think there might be some choices to make about when to slow down. Maybe not every single action in a work of fiction needs to be examined granularly, if that's a way of putting it. And there's a lesson uh, or a line that I always talk about on this show. I feel like my listeners have probably heard me say this a million times by now, but Steve Almond, I think, is the guy that I'm stealing it from where he says, slow down where it hurts. Hmm. And I think that's a nice reminder. I think we have maybe an impulse as writers, especially if it's personally uncomfortable to sort of rush through it. <laughs> And the the bitch of it is that that's exactly where you should slow down. That's exactly where the reader wants you to take your time. And when it comes to maybe writing something that's more uh, suspenseful or thrillerish or, you know, not, not the kind of uh, internal drama or domestic drama or something that you might see in other kinds of fiction, how do you make choices around when to slow down and when to speed up? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, drafting wise, sometimes it's trial and error, right? You sort of, it's hard for me to get that proportion right all the time. Um, I think what we're, what we're doing is exactly what we're saying. We're controlling time. Anna Kesey in an essay called Making a Scene has this great division between story time and discourse time. The story time being how long it takes an event to occur in like real time. And then discourse time being uh, how long it takes to read about it. So like the more you know language you use, the slower it goes on the page, but it doesn't really change how it works in, in real time. And I think that's the thing we're always sort of playing with these. I love that Steve Allman quote. That seems really um, correct. You know, the, the one I always go back to is Anthony Doerr talking about um, uh, trawling through the texture of the dream that we're sort of going kind of slowly through this and trying to find the, show the interesting stuff. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting to me is uh, where the like, 
choices the characters making are when you're slowing down like uh we'll talk a little bit i think about uh, an example from cork mccarthy and in that scene their crux is like is this character going to kill this other man or not and by going slowly through the actions of the potential murder we get to see the moment where it, it tips from potential into like actual and i think that a faster version of that scene wouldn't have those like granular choices that are being made along the way to continue even um that this choice to like commit an act of violence is not like one and done. It's a like, continual through the act of violence and going slower makes that more present and terrifying. I was going to say, it makes it more suspenseful. Yeah. And there's something, there's something else that can happen. I think when you slow down a little bit, not only does it make it more suspenseful for the reader and scarier, but it, you also might as a writer open yourself up to serendipitous insights yeah. uh, like i think you refer to it as like the next level of perception of emotion or insight when you really slow down and you really pay attention to the details sometimes as a writer you can find nice surprises in that process right yeah i think so i think there's all kinds of things that that you just don't bother to describe unless you're in that kind of granular detail and you don't sort of notice um it's really hard in your own life to pay attention to yourself that much i think right to sort of see all the things you're thinking and feeling as you're doing you know, whether that's, you know, hiking up a mountain or making a meal or, you know, being with a loved one or something like the, the granular thoughts are not always accessible to you. But in fiction, I think that I do this and I do this and I do this can sometimes unlock the things that are attached to it. Um, we were talking about cooking, you know, before, like I think about uh, when I'm cooking like a recipe I got from my mom or my grandmother or something. Right. And you go through like their steps and their handwriting. You're thinking about the way they're doing it. You're not only doing that thing physically, but you're remembering the other times you've done it, the other time someone else has done it, you know, your feelings about those times and places. And I think in fiction, there's sometimes um, we rush to sort of explain like action or to, or to talk about it afterwards. And we don't stay with the action and let those things sort of emerge from it. I'm more interested in, as you were saying, the sort of emotions or thought that arise from writing action than sort of like analyzing it afterwards on the page. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. I know there's probably at least one person listening right now who's thinking to themselves, okay, but what about concision? Mm -hmm. What about all that I've read in craft books through the years where people are advocating for efficiency in writing? Well, you know, and so you get to an action sequence and what we're saying is slow down, add some more words, you know, like yeah. pay attention to each step. Uh, you know, I think there's an example you give about like a, what is it? The guard fired. Right. Uh, like you have a guard who's got a weapon and the sentence is the guard fired three words. We, we can all see it. It's clear as day. Uh, what about concision and brevity? How does that factor into the equation here? I mean, I think there's obviously a time and place for everything, right? Like we're certainly not suggesting writing a novel like that's the equivalent of like a movie that was in slow motion the entire time, right? Like that would be unbearable to watch. It's sort of unbearable to read something that's at that detail or mostly, I think. Um, so there, it is, again, the sort of making those like story time, discourse time choices. I think one of the reasons to slow things down uh, beyond all of the stuff we're talking about is it also unpacks the sort of like weirdness or sort of or terror of a lot of things you know we talk all the time about uh the, the most typical examples like a car crash say, like that happened in slow motion right you sort of see this thing uh unveil its way and things feel like that to us there's something about taking something and slowing it down you look at a sentence like the guard fired that's probably about how long it takes to fire a gun right like the story time and discourse time are almost exactly the same but i imagine having never been in this situation that the um the feeling of having someone point a gun at you and fired at you and worrying that they're going to fire it at you and what happens while the bullets in motion and the way that you feel while this thing is about to happen to you is not the guard fired. Like, you know what I mean? I just like that. I do not believe that's the embodied perception of being shot for the most part. Um, again, having not done it, so I don't really know, but you know, I've been punched by someone I didn't expect to punch me. Right. That has a similar, like it takes a second and you're like, Oh my God, this is about to happen. Or being was in a this, car. Was this recently? Was this no, recently? Thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a lot less getting punched in my forties, maybe, um, which is, seems like a, a win all around. Um, yeah. causing less people to want to punch me, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think there's so many of those things, uh, certainly been in a car accident in the last couple of years that where you see, like, you see it sort of happening. There's nothing you can do about it, but like the, the steps sort of unveil in that way. Um, in some ways it often feels slower to me while it's happening than it does afterward. Right? Like it's hard for me to unpack those steps after I've been in a car accident while it's happening. They feel very sort of vivid in a certain way. 
So, you know, the reasons to say the guard fired or not to fire it, um, I can read just really quickly, like the tiniest bit of the example that's from, which is from uh, Brian Evanson's last days. And uh, this is the, the sort of place where the shot happens. He says, uh, this is a character named Klein. Klein was walking toward a guard with a gun in the place of a hand. The guard lifted his arm, intensed his form slightly, and the gun rattled oddly and then fired. He felt his head jerked around and found himself lying on the ground, dirt and blood filling his mouth. There was a strangeness to everything. And then it sort of goes on from there. And so it's not slowed down dramatically. I mean, the sentence where the gun is fired is still one sentence. But you get these sort of like the guards lifting his arm, he's tensing his forearm, and the gun rattles and it fires. Even though like the pulling the trigger takes like two clauses or something, right? And so it's a it's a different speed, but it's in the same way like my car accident example. I think it's the speed at which a person might perceive that happening to them. And as you said, it's also tenser, right? Like taking a little more time with that is still like, will the gun be fired in this sentence? Is a question of that sort of like and 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 construction that you wouldn't have in a simpler sentence. I felt the, te the tension in the forearm just personally, yeah. like, yeah, that. that was, that was the bit. Cause I feel like what you're talking about here to kind of, uh, use a painting comparison. These are small brush stroke decisions. Yeah. These are not big, broad, huge strokes, but they make a huge difference, Yeah, you know? So it's like sometimes this finer brushwork stuff that you do on the page can take what would otherwise be maybe more work a day or mundane or even boring and mm -hmm. you really bring it to life and give the reader like an emotional experience of it yeah uh, and you can oh i'm sorry go ahead Brett. no go for it please i was just gonna say like i think you're also um you're also again seeing it in that for that uh evanson passage like in the body right the the gun fired is like sort of an, an action an object is doing the guard fired the gun is something they're doing with that action this sort of uh the forearm tenses the arm moves this is something like a person's doing with their body in real time like i think it has it's again, it's sort of embodied, even though it's the other character, you know, but it is making these choices about like violence, like a thing a person is choosing to do with their body, as opposed to like an object happens to someone, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is uh, preferable to me in this choice anyway. So let's talk about verbs, because I think the, the word choices that we make in an action sequence, uh, especially the verbs, yeah. make such a huge difference to how impactful the writing is and how uh, emotional and visceral, the reading experiences for the reader. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely right. You know, the, the verbs are literally the place where the action of the story happens, right. You know, it's sort of in a very functional, uh, way. That's how it works. Um, I think, you know, maybe like two big things for me with verbs, uh, talk about this unpacking that we're doing here. One of the ways that I, I think is like a lot of verbs are like nesting dolls. So you can sort of take them apart and find all the verbs that live inside them. Um, again, like to go back to like baking a cake or something or repairing an engine or, you know, any of these kind of things, like that's a verb that has all these parts in it. Right. Um, Brad wrote a novel is a, a sentence that has a lot of parts in it, right? You know, and you can break those out and sort of go into more detail. Um, and so I think that's part of it. Like if you unpack your verbs, sometimes interesting things happen. And then the other part is like a really great verb often allows you to cut all this like bad prose that's just there to describe a boring verb. Um, an example I often use when I'm teaching is uh, like uh, Benjamin Percy's work in Oh, in all his books, but I'm thinking like in Red Moon, he has these great visceral verbs. Uh, there's a part at the beginning that takes place in an airport and just these little details like a security guard, TSA guard, like spotlights someone's ID with a flashlight. Um, and he just says like the security guard spotlighted the ID instead of like the TSA agent looked at his ID or, you know, like looked as so as a boring verb and spotlight. You can see the flashlight. You don't need the flashlight described. You have all these ways of sort of doing that. Um, a coffee carafe is underhanded at someone during a, a terrorist attack on a plane. And that underhanding is so much better than throwing, you know, um, you just find these like verbs that uh, instead of he threw the coffee craft in an underhand motion, right, he underhanded the coffee craft, and it just like allows you to condense. So we're not arguing right for expanding everything. We're like, ex we're still like, we want concision in the even in this expanded moment, we want the best possible and shortest sort of way to the to the action but it doesn't mean that the scene itself has to be short right it's just about compacting what's there okay so what about interiority as it relates to action like uh i think you you advise that depicting action without attaching interiority to it is generally a good idea 
Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think, or at least I think it's complicated. What I don't want, I think, is explanatory interiority, generally, right? Where someone's, I mean, I think uh, this isn't true of all fiction, but a lot of the fiction I like, like analysis is sort of the death of the effect I'm going for. When a character's like analyzing themselves or explaining themselves or or the narrator, the author is explaining the action, which is way worse. Um, I think that's often takes you away from the experience of what's happening on the page. In some ways it's asking you to agree or disagree with the author, right? The author says, this is what that means. Um, but I do think if, you, if you're if you just writing action, you stay with what's physically happening and the embodiment of that action, interesting thoughts and emotions arise from that. And I think it's it's worth including those. But I think the temptation sometimes is to to start writing action and then immediately start like explaining or analyzing or or doing interiority on top of it, which removes us from the the action that's happening in the scene. Um, I I know my own revision. Tons of it is like cutting out interiority. That's me explaining the action to myself, and the reader should be like thinking and feeling those things. If I get them off the page, the reader will have space to do so. So I think people listening might be thinking to themselves, well, what they're talking about here is genre fiction, thrillers, crime novels, sure. sci-fi. But one of the best writers of action uh, in the world is Cormac McCarthy, sure. who is squarely a literary writer. And you, draw, you, you point to him as like an exemplar of uh, action writing. Why, sure. why is that? What does, he, what does he do that is so great? I mean, I think in some ways he's doing a lot of the stuff we're talking about. Like he's, he's going very slow through sort of high tension moments. I always feel long before I had like the literary terms to talk about this stuff. Like you'd read McCarthy and it'd be like, McCarthy knows the name of everything. You feel this like, uh, like everything in the world is something he sort of knows the name of and has some kind of relationship to you. It's one of the pleasures of his books, I think. Like the, the plants of the Southwest and like his Westerns and stuff are, you know, the names of all the trees and all the rocks and all the animals. Um, and, uh, you know, even the judge in, in uh, uh, Blood Meridian, that's like almost part of his power, right? Is this like knowledge of the world. Um, and so I think one of the things you see in McCarthy's action scenes is he stays that close in those moments. He's still like he knows the parts of the knows the parts of the body, knows the parts of the vehicle. He knows the parts of the weapon. He knows the the way a human body moves. And I think it's one of the things that makes his books feel so... Um, uh, the term Evanson would use of this too, like palpable. You really feel like you're in a physical space. You never feel like you're floating when you're reading a McCarthy novel. Um, for better or worse, sometimes that's the horror of reading a McCarthy novel too, right? You can't <laughs> escape sort of the real right. world. Like characters think and talk a lot in his books, but they they always are doing it like in concert with sort of um, a tangible thing they're doing. And I think that's really, um, yeah, it's for me a good example. It's sort of often when an action scene is not working for me, it's because I'm not staying close enough to the world, or I don't know what I'm talking about a little bit. You know, there's some like uh, felt experience that I'm missing. Um, I sort of uh, always feel like McCarthy's done the things he's writing about, even though that would be hopefully not the case. <laughs> <laughs> if, he ha if he has, he's, right, uh, he's right, on, yeah, he's on he's the lamb. Pretty serious research, you know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think that's one of the reasons his books feel the way they do, is this sort of willingness to like, learn everything and it makes him just seem interested in a way that i think is exciting to read his books and that you don't think of as like a top level pleasure of his right but i think it's there all the time in all the novels of his i've read okay so let's let's do you have a, like a brief example from mccarthy's work just so we can kind of illustrate what you're talking about yeah, absolutely. This is from this from his first novel, The Orchard Keeper. Um, I uh, we've been talking about Brian Evanson, but I was brought to this uh, passage from Evanson talking about it at different times. Um, I think it's uh, it's about three pages long, so I'm just going to read like a little bit of it. But uh, his character Souther uh, is um, deciding whether to kill this man who's attacked him. The other the man has attacked him, but he kind of ends up in this hand to hand combat with him. And as it's going on, you can sort of feel him making this decision but it's staying really close to the action so they're in like hand-to-hand -hand sort of combat um and i'll just read a little bit uh like a long paragraph and then two short ones he was jerking at the man's head but the man had both hands over it and seemed lost in speculation upon the pebbles of the road road Salder let his hand relax and wander through the folds of the neck until they arrived at the throat the man took that for a few minutes, then suddenly twisted sideways, spat in Souther's face, and tried to wrench himself free. Souther rolled with him and had him then flat backward in the road and astride him, still the one arm swinging from his broken shoulder like a piece of rope. 
He crept forward and placed one leg behind the man's head, elevating it slightly, looking like some hulking nurse administering to the wounded. He pushed the head back into the crook of his leg, straightened his arm, and bore down upon the man's neck with all his weight and strength. The boneless-looking face twitched a few times, but other than that showed no change of expression, only the same rubbery look of fear, speechless and uncomprehending, which Souther felt was not his doing either, but the everyday look of the man. And the jaw kept coming down, not on any detectable hinges, but like a mass of offal, some obscene waste matter uncongealing and collapsing in slow folds over the web of his hand. It occurred to him then that the man was trying to bite him, and this struck him as somehow so ludicrous that a sort of snort of laughter wheezed in his nose. Finally, the man's hands came up to rest on his arm, the puffy fingers trailing over his own hand and wrist, reminding him of baby possums he had seen once, blind and pink. Souther held him like that for a long time, like squeezing a boil, he thought. After a while, the man did try to say something, but no words came, only a bubbling sound. Souther was watching him in a sort of mesmerized fascination, noting blink of eye, loll of tongue. Then he eased his grip, and the man's eyes widened. For Christ's sake, he gasped, Jesus Christ, just turn me loose. Souther put his face to the man and in a low voice said, you better call on somebody closer than that. So pretty heavy for a children's book, <laughs> I've got to say, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you should see the illustrations, you know. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. But a, a Caldecott, a Caldecott winner. Unbelievable. But, uh, no, I mean, like he's the best, you know, like right. You, you're, you're right there with him at every step of the way. And it's uncomfortable which it should be yeah and like you I said, there's so like it's three a, pages of that right like that goes on yeah. for a while like that's a long time you're you know yeah yeah well it's like the thing you know slow down where it hurts i guess that means like it hurts emotionally but also slow down where it's tense yeah slow down where it's uncomfortable in any way it might be just a good rule of thumb as yeah. you're working on your on your fiction and there's another writer uh garth greenwell who yeah. i've had on my show before and he, too, is excellent at writing action scenes. Uh, is there anything that he does that you would have um, that you could point to that's uh, in any way different? I guess he's probably doing a lot of the same things that McCarthy's doing and that anybody's doing if they're writing action well. You know, it's it's interesting. I was thinking about uh, so the, I'm going to read something from the history of the Frog King in a minute, and I was thinking about why Greenwell feels a little different to me because I think that the passage I read will feel similar in some ways. But I think Greenwell's characters, maybe unlike McCarthy's, are often like deeply in their own heads, right? Like they're really like thinking through things. They're really it's always sort of about memory and about these like nuances of um, conversation and what what this person meant, what I meant, or how we're miscommunicating. And then I think in Greenwell's uh, uh, sex scenes or, or places uh, where he's depicting some kind of like physical action, that some of that um, overthinking will fall away or a character will get like really close to what they really mean in these moments where they're like in their body. And I, I don't know if this is how Greenwell would describe it, but for me, there is like a difference between the narrators of his books when they're um, like na just narrating or telling their own story and in these moments where they're like, closely depicting a thing they did usually with another person and in those moments they get to like uh, maybe a truer sort of version of themselves that's difficult to access when it's just their brain in motion so like the embodied version of them is somehow like a truer expression of their desires or their their hopes or their feelings for someone than they're sort of just talking about their feelings or thinking about their feelings which um, tend to move in a more sort of like circular or searching sort of fashion well, and, you know, Garth Greenwell, it should be said, is excellent at writing about sex. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I had him on for his novel, Cleanness. Yeah. I think that's the one that I that I read. And I really it really jumps off the page. You're like, wow, this guy's excellent at this. And again, to kind of carry forward the little slow down where it hurts, slow down where it's uncomfortable, slow down where it's intense. And it doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe we're like emotional and physical experience is heightened. Is yeah. Is always a good time to to ratchet down the pace so is there an ex example of greenwell's work that we could look at that might Absolutely. illustrate this and you know right before i i, I read it i also say going after last point i think we were talking about like when to make these choices and one of the the things that's just sort of obviously true about prose is like the more time you spend on something the more attention you're putting on it and the more attention you're asking the reader to give it right and so some of it is like 
you make the things that you want the reader to pay attention to take longer on the page or, or you spend more detail with them. And I think that's um, part of how we're making these decisions, right? Uh, this is from Greenwell's story, The Frog King. Uh, maybe like two thirds of the way through the story, there's uh, a sex scene between the narrator and his boyfriend. Um, it uh, it begins sort of uh, like they're watching a movie and they're kissing. We'll hear that right away. And it kind of, you know, moves into sort of a full sex scene. It's a really long passage. I'm trying to remember how long it is, but I'm going to say like at least like five pages. It's one long paragraph. I think it's a really striking piece of writing. I'm just going to read the first like, maybe half page of it, uh, just so you can sort of get the, the feel of it. Um, okay, this is from The Frog King. We watched a movie sitting side by side on the couch. I don't remember what it was, something lighthearted, romantic, though we hardly laughed. We never really watched movies together. It was always a pretense. We would kiss and touch each other and then forget the movie, but now it was all I could do to get him to kiss me back. Finally, he let me pull him up from the couch. I folded the computer shut and let him half resisting into the bedroom. He resisted less there, standing beside the bed. He opened his mouth to me. He let him draw. He let me draw him close and press my pelvis against his. He raised his arms for me to pull his shirt up and off, and I felt the mood shifting already. It lightened as his passivity became a game almost. His passivity in my insistence as I struggled with the bucket buckle of his belt, the button on his jeans. I could feel him almost smile as I kissed him, as he answered me back more in his kisses, his tongue pressing against mine. I pushed his jeans and underwear down, breaking our kiss to kneel and hold them at his ankles while I lifted his legs free, kissing his cock, which wasn't hard yet, just once before I rose again. He moved to kiss me again, but I leaned away, then shoved him back. Not hard. He could have resisted, but he didn't. He fell backward onto the bed. Onto our bed, I thought, which is what it had become in those days. Not a lonely place, but a place that belonged to both of us. A loving place. It was something I could think to myself but not say out loud. Um, okay. I think that's so fantastic. Two, thing, yeah. two things strike me. Yeah, it is. And two things strike me because writing about sex, I think can be challenging for people Ooh, or so intimate hard. action. Yeah. And one of the things that I think I notice when it's done well is how matter of fact it is. Yeah. And how it's like plain English tends to work better than florid uh, <laughs> adjectives. And, yes. You know what I'm saying? Like uh -huh. it's, it's like the being blunt about it tends to be effective. But I also really admire the way, like you were saying, that he's interweaving that kind of blunt action with, I think, more lyrical interiority. Yeah. Uh, like the way that the character is kind of going through this very physical and intimate act, but at the same time, kind of reflecting a little bit as, as you go without losing the momentum, you know, or, or disorienting the reader, which can happen if you, if you, you know, uh, get yourself distracted <laughs> yeah. along the way. <laughs> you know, right? I think, um, I think maybe two things about it. One is, you know, that part of the flat language made me think of, I think I learned this from Dill Landis. who learned it from Jim Crusoe, who got it from Chekhov. It's one of these things, right? But uh, Chekhov talked about like in moments of high intensity, you should go cold. You know, like the colder you go on the page, the more room it makes for the reader's emotions. Um, and I think it's, I remember how Landis described it. Crusoe would talk about it like a scale of one to 10. And like, you're always going to get to like 10 emotionally, but you can, it's how much you want the reader to have. You know, if you put seven on the page, there's only room for like three for the reader. If you go flat and put like two on the page, maybe the reader could does eight. And there's a way to like, by being flat, the reader will like emotionally respond to it. Um, it's certainly something I think I practice in writing violence in, in my work, you know, something that freaks me out. And I, you know, in real life, I'm a pacifist who really doesn't want everybody to ever get hurt ever. And then, you know, I write these sort of violent scenes. And, um, and I think one of the ways that I make them effective is to not be like, look how bad this is, right? You actually like present it and the reader goes, look how bad this is, you know, you sort of react in a different way. Um, the other part that I think is hard to hear from the Greenwell, but people should look the story up. It's on, on, it's, it was in the New Yorker, so you can find it on the website. Um, the thoughts in those sentences are never in their own sentence. They're just these little clauses tucked in the action. Like he's not stopping to think. They're these um, off hands, almost thoughts that are happening, like as physical action is happening. So the oh. the sort of feelings are even kind of jammed into the action as opposed to an action happens and then he thinks for a while or action happens or he feels for a while. There are these things that are happening as the scene is sort of unfolding, which I think is, um, I think worth looking at at the sentence level in the Greenwell. I was going to say, so just so listeners understand, what you're saying is that 
a sentence that is describing a physical action has within it or attached to it the interiority. There's not right. a, a there's not a, a, a punctuation mark and then the beginning of interiority. The interiority is part of the action sentence. Yeah, absolutely. That, so they're sort of like syntactically riding alongside each other as opposed to being two separate things. Great. So yeah. I think just to, to wrap things up, like what good action on the page does to the reader is that it prevents the reader from ever having a passive experience when that is not what the story calls for. Yeah. <laughs> that, <right>. You know, <laughs> you, you don't want somebody reading a murder scene passively. You don't want somebody reading a sex scene passively. Yeah. You want that person to be uh, involved. Yeah. And so following these guidelines will help you get there. Yeah, I think that sounds right to me. I think um, it seems to me that so much of what we're trying to do in, in the kind of fiction most people write, at least most Americans write, where they're writing in first person and like the kind of close third, like free and direct style, you know, very few of us write like omniscient narrators anymore, is about reducing the distance between the character and the reader. And so some of this is like, can you bring the reader close to the character's body? Can you put them there with them? And so these are some of the tactics that we're using to do that. Um, it, it helps break the illusion that we're reading a book, right? We want to fall into the sort of embodied, immersed experience on the page, um, ideally. And when that's not happening, we feel it, right? It's, it's kind of awful reading when you can't like subsume into the dream of it in this way. And so I think like this kind, these kind of tactics are ways of keeping the reader close to the action of the book. So what about something that listeners can do to practice right. <laughs> this? Is there, is there a way, is there a way to actually strengthen these muscles as a writer and to get better? You know, like, is there something that you might tell your students in class to do just to sort of get them to actualize this in their yeah. own work? Absolutely. You know, the, the exercise I assign when I'm uh, uh, teaching these ideas is I have them write either a scene or sort of a complete flash fiction depicting a single activity from beginning to end. And I think uh, generally for the exercise purposes, it's best not for it to be like a murder or right, you know, like something like deeply mundane. You're fixing your car, you're cleaning your house, you're knitting a sweater, like something that you that they know how to do, or they've they've seen done, but is not like exciting, right? Like we want to do something that has steps. And so I think, you know, the more mundane it can be. Um, one of the things I, I sort of think is true of maybe all not all, but a lot of like literary fiction is this like attention to the sort of unnoticed details of our life. Like the unnoticed steps of these actions are the ways we spend our life. So I think if we can write about those, it's a way to sort of see ourselves or to see others. Um, and then when you're doing that, I think some of the things might be to, to practice staying with each action, sort of going inward rather than moving on. You know, our, our natural tendency when writing is to like rush to the next thing. And I think if you can go deeper instead of going forward, that's really successful. And then I think I would also say, like, not to start with thoughts or feelings, not to have interpreted this event in advance. You know, um, it'd be really easy to say, like, when my mom made me, like, my favorite pie on my birthday, that's, like, one of the ways my mom showed me she loved me, right? But if I wrote about, like, if I, if I start from that, then that's the point of the scene. But if I start writing about my mom making that pie and the steps of it and how she does it, I might get to like her experience of that or her sort of felt experience or what it really felt like as a kid to watch her do that, as opposed to my sort of interpretation that's already on the event. Um, and, you know, if thoughts or feelings arise as you're writing through the steps of a consecution, I think that's fine. But I think it's best not to begin from them. Um, and then to remember that you're manipulating that story time, discourse time, what you sort of spend more time on will be felt more than the stuff you sort of uh, skim over. So trying to make those feelings sort of felt as much as possible in that way. All right. Well, this has been extremely helpful and I appreciate you taking us through this and sharing what you know. Where can people uh, read more? Like I know you have a craft book out. Sure. Where can they get that? What about uh, where you live online or where you teach? Like how can people learn more from you? Sure. Uh, I'm a professor in the MFA program at Arizona State University. So people who are looking for an MFA program should come and work with us there. Um, I also write a, a substack uh, called No Failure Only Practice at mattbell.substack.com. And then my craft book is called Refuse to Be Done. And, you know, it's available wherever you buy your books. All right. Great to talk with you, Matt. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me, Brad. It's always a pleasure.